we went to mass on Sunday. I need your help because <laughs> sure. I think I need to write a letter. We went to mass on Sunday at a church that's not ours typically because it was time, the time worked out. And so um, I got really uncomfortable at the end. We ended up not taking the Eucharist and okay. I left. But, you know, I'm sitting with my daughter who's about to go to college and I'm trying to influence her to keep up her practice and the importance of Christ and our yeah. sacraments. So I had to give her what I had, but I, but I need your help. So they said the Mass, ended the Mass, and then told us that we were to receive Eucharist on the way out, that we weren't allowed to come back in. We had to leave. And they were giving Eucharist with tong. Ugh. And so, um, you know, besides the obvious complaints, well, I think they're obvious, I don't know, you know, and I told my daughter about mm-hmm. this intimate moment and how we need to come back and pray. And um, yeah, I really felt like I was being asked to leave, you know, like, hey, we've had this intimate moment. Now you need to go. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't receive Eucharist. We said our our peace in our cars and then we took off. But um, I had a problem with that. But some of the problem I have is why we're following this. And, and this is kind of what I went into with my daughter is, you know, I feel like we are a church of martyrs. And we have all these saints, like, and I don't know who she is, but the young girl who, during the Nazi regime, went out every night and ate the Eucharist off the ground that they had, Mm -hmm. you know, strewn about. And, um, you know, our priests, I feel like they're not those people. And I mean, I'm just only speaking of the ones that are in front of me. I don't want to, I don't want to put them all in one pot, but this particular situation I felt was giving up line. kind of. I, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, why are we listening? Why are we gone this far? Why are we listening to the, to the government at all? It's my understanding that the way the con- not constitution and bill of rights is written, that they aren't allowed. The government is not allowed to overreach into our, what I thought was like a sovereign governing Religion, well, we're not you know, sovereign in a in a strict sense, but we are. Okay. We have rights that should not be interfered with by secular government. That's for sure. Um, I hear what you're saying, and I can imagine how that was very um, discouraging for you. I, I could only imagine it, it, the the whole idea of distributing Holy Communion with tongs is offensive to pious ears and should be because I mean it it's it's. Well, I won't get into all the whys and wherefores except to say that I think that's very unfortunate to say the least. I'd like to suggest that you check out a blog post by Father John Zulsdorf. He goes by Father Z on Twitter. Father, so F-A-T-H-E-R-Z, the letter Z. And he has this interesting post that I retweeted. He says, uh, this is urgent, time-sensitive, info needed about denial of communion on the tongue. He says... Um, he's keeping this open. He says, canonist, so in other words, a canon lawyer, contacted me asking for help in a worthy endeavor. He is collecting some information for defense of communion on the tongue. Now, that this would extend into the kind of thing that you're seeing here. And it is a way of giving examples of problems that you've encountered that can be relayed to the congregation for the doctrine of, I'm sorry, the congregation for uh, do- divine worship and the discipline of the sacraments, which has charge of issues like this. So although it's not exactly the scenario that you lay out, it is related to it, and it's already gotten 1,460 responses. So that might be something to check out and see if that kind of, what I interpret to be a kind of petition or dubia that would be sent to that congregation if that might encompass other things like distributing Holy Communion with tongs or things of that nature. So if you're interested in seeing that, Noel, that would be my suggestion. In the meantime, however, since things are as they are and you're not in a position to be able to change them, you can do a couple things. Number one, of course, you can go to Holy Mass and receive Holy Communion in the way that they're prescribing. And the Lord knows your heart and he knows that you would rather not have to do it this way. But if that's what you need to do to receive our Lord and Holy Communion, he understands. Another thing that some people do is they say, I will just wait until things get back to normal and I will make a spiritual communion and I won't receive Holy Communion. Now that 
instinctively we should kind of recoil against and away from and just say no because I want to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. When we go to Mass, we desire to receive him in Holy Communion. But remember this. In the history of the Church, we experience as normal nowadays, or at least until the middle of March, end of March, um, it was not at all normal in the Church Universal for many centuries, and that was to receive Holy Communion frequently. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to discourage anybody from receiving Holy Communion frequently. If anything, I encourage it, as Pope St. Pius X did. He's the one who strongly encouraged people to receive Holy Communion frequently, daily, if you'd like to. But that wasn't always the case. So if you look back over the history of the Church, let's say 1,500 years or so, what you'll see is that the great saints, they, they were not in the habit of receiving Holy Communion frequently, the way we are. St. Teresa of Avila, great example a towering example of sanctity. And she did not receive Holy Communion. She certainly didn't receive Holy Communion every week, much less every day. And that's because it was the custom to do so. Customs change. So all I'm saying here is with regard to precedent and how even a, an occasional reception of Holy Communion was sufficient to nourish sanctity in many great saints, men, women, boys, and girls, If you were to choose that path, you would not be doing something inherently wrong, just as they were not doing anything inherently wrong if they chose to make a spiritual communion because the way in which communion is being distributed is bothersome to them. Does that make sense? Do you see the context I'm trying to give? Yeah, I do. And I'm, and I'm good with that. And I didn't, it it wasn't that I wasn't going to receive Eucharist. We we both decided that wasn't going to happen. I I guess my snap decision, which sounds like I was on the right path after listening to you, was that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And um, I just, we just didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to discourage guess, you from receiving communion, but I understand yeah. if if you're in turmoil at Mass and you're fighting these thoughts of judgment and, and criticism and anger, and that gets in the way of trying to worthily receive Holy Communion, I can understand that. So, yeah. you know, sometimes the best thing to do is to just, okay, Lord, you know my heart. I'm here at Mass, and um, I wish that things would get better. I guess my other qu- question, which came up in the car on the ride home, was what is our... <laughs> I feel like the obedience is getting a bit difficult for me um, because I feel like I feel like we're not doing the right thing. Like, we're not living our life mm-hmm. as martyrs. We're not... Oh, but you are. Or... Oh, but you are. Oh. <laughs> let me share. <laughs> let me share something that's <laughs> counterintuitive to all of us. Ready? If you if you talk to religious sisters and religious brothers and priests, those who are under vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, more often than not, what they'll tell you is chastity is not the most difficult of the of the um, evangelical virtues. It's it's not the most difficult. It's difficult, but I, I would think personally that would be the most difficult because I'm a married man. So for me, that's like, wow, that's a real sacrifice, okay? But more often than not, religious sisters and brothers and priests will tell you it's not that, it's obedience. That's the real difficult one. And for me, it sounds counterintuitive, but here's why it's not. Because that is the form of martyrdom that the Lord is asking you to undergo right now. That when a superior is unjust or capricious or tyrannical or petty or negligent or you fill in the blank, you know, just pick the term that describes some deficient exercise of authority, your obedience in everything except sin, and you know, n- none of us is compelled to be obedient if somebody's telling you to commit a sin, obviously. But these are not incentives to commit sin. They're just not the way they should be. And who knows what the thinking is that any given cleric may have in his mind when he issues directives. And who knows? Only God knows. I don't know. So the best thing in situations like that, if you're seeking martyrdom, is there is the cross that Christ is asking you to carry right now. Here and now, that's the cross. And in your obedience, you cultivate the virtue of humility. And sometimes in the Christian life, it's easy to mistake our desire or our zeal for something good 
we can think that that's what's really going on, but what's really actually going on is our pride has been bothered, our pride has been disturbed, and by golly, we're going to fight for our rights because, you know, you know how that goes? So you can kill two birds with one stone. You can cultivate humility, and you can also cultivate that virtue of a kind of holy obedience, a holy docility, even when a given superior is doing something that God may judge him for. But you'll grow in holiness. And great saints have undergone this. Great, great. I mean, take St. John of the Cross, for example. He was beaten, I mean, physically beaten by members of his community because he didn't like some of the things he was saying in terms of reforming their laxity of observing their rule in religious life. And he took it. He just, I mean, that's an injustice, clearly. But he did not run away. He did not, you know, he he just took it. And you and I have far less to have to deal with compared to something that he did. But I think there's a lesson mm. there for all of us. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I'm glad I called you. So maybe not a letter, letter writing moment, just um, just an obedience moment. <laughs> I think so. I, I do think so. I mean, I'm like you, and probably most of us are like this, that we want to fix the problem. We're Americans, after all. By golly, we're going to fix this problem. You know, I'm going to I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to demand that this be done right. And so often in life, especially in the life of the church, it does it doesn't happen that way. And you have a, a negligent priest or a whatever bishop, and you just you you learn to grow in holiness, and you are refined in that kind of fiery, difficult moment, and you become a better Christian. And your pride is not fed, and your humility is cultivated. And it's mm. hard. <laughs> it's really hard. But I hard. think that's the path that the saints... And look at Jesus. Jesus was the meekest, most humble, and he was God. He could have done anything. I mean, like he told Pontius Pilate, I could send legions of angels to deal with this problem, but I'm not going to. So Jesus gives us this example of humility. In When obedience is required, it's difficult, it's we chafe, our pride gets in the way, but it can be good for us. It is good for us to cultivate that kind of humility. I'm not trying to give you a sermon, Noel. I'm really not. If anything, this is probably as much for me as it is for you. No, it's very good. Thank you. I'm. I this is why I asked for help. Right. I can only see it one way. So, I, mean, I think it's important yeah. today that we all start looking in every direction. I agree. Well, let's pray for each other. How Thank about you. that? Let's pray for each other. Yep, for sure. All right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Noel. God bless you. For more of the Patrick Madrid Show, visit relevantradio.com/patrick.